uh, this this evening after dinner uh, in the in the sec near the secretariat. So there will be a process through which uh, we are we are going to do it, and and the drafting committee will will really listen to the comments as well. These are in addition to the inputs which we are getting from that. We are hoping that if we have a final draft put on the website uh, tomorrow morning, people can have a look at it so that in the closing ceremony, closing of uh, plenary, we can adopt it. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to Ashok. Morning. I, I hope you um, had a good night's sleep after that uh, wonderful evening that we had yesterday, uh, and the whole day, in fact. Um, today, um, to true to CEE traditions, we're really going to try and keep on time. We've got to uh, track ourselves because there's so much to do, and we would like really to stick to the schedule as much as possible. Uh, this morning, we start with the most important set of uh, problems that educationists have, which is how do we explain to the world how valuable our work is? How do we uh, get across to the decision makers, the politicians, the economists who advise them, uh, and their basic uh, bureaucratic support systems that putting money into education is probably the best investment there is in the world? Well, you know, the poets and the philosophers have been saying this all along, but that's not always very plausible or persuasive for uh, economists and politicians. So we now need action to put the whole uh, issue of the value, valuation of education at various levels into forms that they understand. You and I know, you and I know that education is a human right. It's a basic right of every human being. You and I know that uh, there is no question. There isn't even a question of why we should have good education for all. Uh, but they don't. And in order to be able to persuade them, we must have various kinds of methods, metrics, uh, by which we measure and explain uh, how education has an impact which is of value to them. And what do they value? They value GDP growth, they value foreign direct investment, they value uh, things like the stock market index. They've, they've got their own value systems. And unfortunately, uh, they don't budge unless um, things are explained to them in those terms. Uh, I don't think it's prostituting ourselves to be able to say, Education is a fundamental right of every citizen of the world, and that's all. But also to convert some of these arguments into plausible arguments that can be understood by decision makers. So today we're going to be talking about um, how do we measure uh, these uh, achievements, indicators if you like. Uh, and indicators can come in many forms. You can have 100, 150, 200 indicators uh, describing uh, various aspects of uh, the um, outcomes of education, but um, people don't always understand them. So we've got to also remember that our work is not simply to make it complex, but ultimately to make it simple enough to be understood. Uh, indicators lead to indexes, lead to ways in which we can communicate. And the other part of it is, of course, we are uh, particularly in India, but maybe all over the world, uh, very used to input indicators. How much was spent? How many classrooms were built? How many uh, teachers were trained? Uh, that's all right. It's, it's a first beginning. But it's actually the results, the outcomes, and the impacts uh, that really count. And we forget that often. And in fact, uh, until we're able to uh, insist on looking at the end product, uh, not just better citizens, but more capable citizens of living in harmony with nature and with each other in a planet that has some kind of a future. So uh, our work here today is really to share uh, the experiences of people who had some. I'm not going to talk for any longer because uh, we're really trying to stick to time. We've given each of the speakers, some of whom have um, 
joined me on the podium already, and some are coming in a few minutes, uh, 10 minutes, which is very tight. So uh, we would appreciate your being um, very attentive because we're going to convey a huge amount of information and knowledge during these 10 minutes. We're going to have um, Aaron uh, Menavod, who is uh, Director of the Global Education Monitoring Support Report. Um, I won't go into details because all the biographies are in your notes, uh, but uh, he has been an advisor to governments, to UNESCO, and to many other bodies. Uh, then we will have Jean-Christophe uh, Carteron, uh, who is um, a director of CSR at Kedge Business School in France, and has done some remarkable work on developing indicators um, for education and sustainable development knowledge, particularly. Dr. Sudarshan Iyengar, who is a former Vice Chancellor of Gujarat Vidyapit, and he will be, he has a, a great deal of uh, insight into um, the issues that we're discussing. He will be followed by Sonal Zaveri. Uh, she's an independent consultant for the last 25 odd years uh, on strategic planning and evaluation. And finally, we'll have uh, a young person who will join us here, who will be fine, uh, Martin Ch um, Chardel, who uh, is a um, computer engineer uh, by training and uh, he will be uh, looking at how all these indicators we're talking about translate into impacts on the ground. Uh, so may I invite Aaron? Uh, it's a real honor to be invited here. I'd like to thank very much the Center for Environmental Education for giving me the opportunity to speak before you. Um, I am director of a team that produces an annual report uh, has been producing reports for the last uh, 13 years. We are now in the, uh, preparing a report that will be launched in September of this year. And in many ways, this conference uh, reflects and epitomizes some of the key contents of the report that we're working on, uh, since the theme of this new report that uh, we will be developing examines each of the reciprocal relations between education and each of the other SDGs. We're an evidence-based report, so we're very much uh, linked to trying to find evidence in relationship to uh, each of these uh, very complex kinds of ideas. This gives you an idea of some of the reports that we've produced thus far. Um, the mandate for the team uh, derived from a meeting of the international education community in Dakar, Senegal in May of 2000, when the education for all goals were established. These are a little bit different than the MDG goal on education. Uh, and the monitoring report was known as the EFA Global Monitoring Report, uh, had the purpose of tracking progress at the national level with respect to each of these key EFA goals. And then eventually each of the reports took up a particular theme and looked at this theme in great uh, detail and uh, depth. Um, if we have a few of these little USB keys um, that, um, are, that I'm able to disseminate all the reports and all the background work that we've ever done is actually on this little USB key. So if you don't get it, uh, let us know. Send us an email and I'll be happy to send one to you. Uh, the reports are disseminated in all the UN languages. Uh, and the summary report is actually coming out in quite a few other languages, including Hindi and Urdu and other languages to further disseminate our work. Uh, the audiences that we're trying to convince are policymakers at the national level, at the subnational level, uh, those uh, organizations that are involved in providing educational aid, uh, donor agencies, governments. Um, so very much the report has a global perspective, which is a little bit different from some of the work that's been presented here. Um, we've had three external evaluations, and uh, this last evaluation has certainly demonstrated that we've kind of created a niche within the international education community and is seen as the go-to reference in terms of a high quality, comprehensive, evidence-based report with very clear messages uh, for the policy world. Now, one of the things that the report team has produced uh, increasingly over the last few years are more focused publications. The full report is a 500-page report, which often is a little bit difficult to go through. Uh, but uh, we've uh, also been producing policy papers on very focused uh, subjects, regional overviews that look at the situation in each of the world regions. We have uh, several gender summaries that take out 
all the key findings that we uh, have articulated in the main report that have a gender dimension. Uh, that we just uh, launched a gender report in New York and also in Paris uh, last year that uh, was very has been very well received. Uh, all of these materials are downloadable at our website free of charge. We also put together a youth report and several other uh, te technical papers. Um, the point that I wish to make at this, uh, at this juncture is that the work of the team in some ways has come to an end. The mandate that we had uh, ended in December 2015 and uh, we've been working very hard together with the international education community uh, in order to receive a new mandate uh, for the next 15 years. And the process, as you know, for the uh, education community has been a decision that was taken uh, approximately a year and a half ago in Muscat, Oman, to unify the educational priorities with the broader development priorities and to become part of the SDG agenda. Uh, this was a decision uh, that was made in order not to have the two separate tracks uh, that had been uh, characterizing uh, the work of educationalists up until uh, this time. And so now we are part of the SDG agenda and one of the SDG uh, uh, development goals and each of the different targets. Um, I, I know we're all very familiar with it. We now have a new mandate. The mandate uh, derived from the key statements that occurred in two major meetings uh, last year, one in Seoul, uh, and the second one in uh, a document that was produced uh, in, and, and agreed upon by ministers of education in September. Uh, called the Education 2030 Framework for Action, in which this new report, now we have a new name, called the Global Education Monitoring Report, is now considered the key mechanism for monitoring progress on SDG4 in all its various dimensions. So we have a new mandate, a new logo, as you can see here, and uh, you can see some of the work that we're doing. Now, as you know, beyond the uh, 10 targets within the Education SDG, there are particular indicators that have been put forward by a technical advisory group, and some of these have been uh, adopted by uh, a committee that's called the Interagency uh, Committee for uh, the Indicators of the SDGs in New York. These are now going to be defined as global indicators. So the technical advisory group under SDG 4 has come up with approximately 43 thematic indicators, of which 10 or 11 are being defined as global indicators. This distinction between global, thematic, regional, and national indicators is a distinction that was put forth in the synthesis report of the UN Secretary General uh, some months ago, and it is this distinction also that has an impact on the kind of monitoring work that we do. So to give you an idea uh, of the work that went forward by the technical advisory group. This was established after the meeting in Muscat Oman in 2014, and various proposals will be, would, were put forward. And the most recent proposal is the one that was integrated in the annex of the framework for action that was adopted by the ministers of education in September. And this other group that meets in New York is beginning to identify for each of the 169 targets under the SDGs either one or sometimes two global indicators that will uh, commit countries to compile information about these particular global indicators and therefore have quite a lot of consequences. Uh, the final uh, de uh, distinction or the final definition of which uh, these global indicators will be coming in some months uh, in the spring of next year, but we can already have a very clear idea of uh, how this work will go forward. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, here are each of the sustainable development targets and the global indicators that have been defined. So what we begin to see here is that there's an increasing, uh, how should we say, disjuncture between the intent of the target and the actual indicator that is being articulated and agreed upon by uh, the international, by the UN uh, committees in New York. So for example, the first target, which in many ways is the most ambitious, to ensure that all girls and boys complete free, equitable, and quality primary and secondary education, leading to relevant and effective learning outcomes. That means 12 years of formal schooling with an ability to measure and compare uh, key learning outcomes across different countries. Enormously ambitious. Now notice that the only global target that's been articulated for this 
uh, first, uh, the global indicator that's been articulated for this target looks at the percentage of children. So the emphasis is on the outcome only, not so much on participation rates. The outcome only percentage of children or young people at each level, this is mainly at the end of primary and the end of lower secondary, achieving at least a minimum proficiency level in reading and mathematics. So the idea of relevant and effective learning outcomes has now been narrowed to two basic skills which I think is a highly problematic uh, way forward. And it's one of the kinds of issues that our report will take up in September as we begin to kind of uh, examine critically each of the different targets and some of the different indicators. You can also see on each of the other uh, education targets the kind of indicators that have been put forward. It, the other point that I would make is that none of these global indicators is there actually data available to track progress. So not only is the target ambitious, but the definition of the global indicator that's been put forward by the committees in New York, the UN committees, are also very ambitious in which the feasibility of this, to say nothing of the politics around it, are still very contested and quite extensive. So even some of the basic ideas like uh, the participation rates of adults in formal and non-formal education and training in the last 12 months, we don't have that kind of information available for the 197 or 200 different independent nation states in the world. What we have is often limited information for some groups of countries at very particular time points. So one of the things that we certainly come across uh, that is uh, derived from this new agenda for the international education community is that the ambitiousness means that we really do need to have uh, a lot of interagency cooperation in developing new sources of data quite different from the kind of sources that we've been using thus far. Um, so that beyond the kind of typical surveys that go out from UNESCO's Institute for Statistics from Montreal uh, that uh, ministries of education are asked to uh, fill out once a year to give only administrative data, we now need much more detailed information coming from household surveys, from various kinds of learning assessments, some of which perhaps could be uh, articulated and compared. So the challenges that remain, and this, uh, with this I will conclude, that first of all, on the, on the positive side of things, as we compare what happened after the Dakar meeting, we certainly have a lot more work upstream, you might call it, of different experts in looking at the uh, the various targets that have been put forward in this very ambitious agenda with respect to education and drawing out some of the uh, relations with the, some of the other SDGs. Yeah. A lot of uh, work has, has occurred prior to the actual, uh, the actual adoption of the agenda. Having said that, what we do not yet see, and perhaps we will never see for many years to come, is a broad consensus both at the global level, at the national level, and even at the subnational level as to, number one, how to articulate each of the different targets and what kinds of indicators are best put forward and invested in in order to examine the extent to which countries, again, at, the, at this larger macro level, are making progress with respect to the SDG agenda. Clearly, some of these key concepts uh, within the agenda, like inclusiveness, like quality, which have been discussed here at this meeting, are not easily definable and uh, uh, interpreted. And uh, clearly, the idea of which, of, for example, the one uh, concept that I'll uh, make reference to in greater detail in my uh, discussion uh, this afternoon, in, uh, which is 4.7 around education for sustainable development, here you have a target in which everything including gender equality, multiculturalism, global citizenship, and sustainability issues are, are all encapsulated in a single target. And the question then becomes, which of these different concepts do we prioritize? What kind of indicators could possibly put, uh, be put forward in order to draw some uh, reflection about country progress and investments in each of these different uh, aspects? So clearly we have enormous challenges both in terms of interpreting the targets, developing indicators, and trying to monitor progress uh, to say nothing of trying to draw out the linkages between education and each of the other SDGs. There's a lot of work uh, to be done, and I must say that for, I've learned a lot from listening to uh, colleagues here attending this conference, and I uh, very much hope that you will uh, be interested in uh, uh, working with us and looking at some of the materials that we produce over the course of the, uh, the very uh, coming months 
Uh, so please uh, come to our website and, uh, uh, and uh, register for our blog. We'd be happy to uh, get your comments and uh, be involved in uh, uh, various kinds of exchanges in the months to come. Thank you very much. Um, we, we, we're going to speak, I'm, I'm going to speak about measurement and, and metrics on, on higher education. So first of all, uh, I'm working for a business school in France called Cage, uh, based in Marseille and Bordeaux. Uh, in the south of France, um, um, and they call me the virus, uh, the sustainable development virus. My job is to be everywhere in the school, uh, so, um, so roughly speaking my job is to try to put sustainable development into the research, into the pedagogy, into the, the campus as a green campus, and of course the social aspects, etc. I will, I will uh, speak a, a little bit further. Um, First of all, and I do think it's quite important, if we want to speak about measurement and about metrics, we should ask ourselves, why do we need uh, to, to measure? And, and I, I think that they are, and depending on the, the, the institution, they, they could have different uh, goals uh, for measuring. Uh, if, I, if I take my example, uh, we start this, um, uh, the, the, the Department of Sustainable Development at Cage uh, eight years ago uh, with a, a team and a budget uh, dedicated to that. Um, and one of the key elements to use metrics was to define the strategy. We have many, many action in the school, um, great people working, students, uh, projects, etc., etc. Uh, but we were not able to understand that all of those action uh, uh, courses, uh, research projects, or even uh, an activity, a student activity, uh, can be linked. So, so for my point of view, is really sharing a vision. As soon as you have metrics, you can discuss with people who don't have exactly the same point of view, but at least it, it's a minimum, no, uh, minimum uh, the basic. Uh, knowledge to discuss with, with others. Uh, of course, if you have metrics, you can compare, you can benchmark yourself with, with, uh, with, your, with your colleagues. Um, of course, um, if you don't measure, it's really, really, really difficult to plan and to implement uh, and to decide. Because uh, even if we try to do our best, uh, a day is just 24 hours, and, and, and at the end of the day, you have to make choices. So, so you, you need to decide, is, is, should, should I put more energy in creating a new courses on sustainable development? Or should I try to launch a project on, um, I don't know, uh, waste or solar panel on the, on, uh, for, for the university? Um, I do think that the idea of selling is not selling just um, uh, selling the school, or selling the university, but it can be, if you have indicator, it can really help you to, um, of course, to, to sell the idea of what you are doing outside the school. Some students and more and more students are really asking you some, some facts and figures on what you, what you are trying to do. And, and also to try to convince inside the school and try to be able to discuss with people who actually are not the more engaged people on sustainable development. It's thanks to my indicator. We have we, we published now for seven years uh, a sustainable development report. Uh, I have just one example, but you, you can download it um, with indicators. And it's thanks to this um, the, the, the fact that we published the report, and then we need metrics to put on this report that I was able dif uh, really to discuss with my financial director in the school because he understand and we can uh, target some some goals, etc., etc. Uh, sometimes obligation can come from government, sometimes it can come from, for instance, in business school, the major trigger is our ranking and accreditation. And then, for instance, Equis, which is one of the three major rank, um, accrediting bodies for business school, they have one full chapter uh, on ethics and responsibility. So if you have fact and figures, when you have the peer review, it's going to help you uh, to, uh, to discuss with, with, with your, with your uh, the accrediting, uh, accrediting bodies. Of course, to control, or to at least to believe that you control something, um, I, I think it's quite important because you, if, even if, uh, I don't know if we are all really efficient, but at least it's, it's cool if you, if you believe 
sometimes you are doing you are doing well and you achieve something. But I think the mo the most important thing, and if if I if I may, uh, John, on I shall, uh, what I shall say this morning, it's um, we are living in a world where everything is misery. Uh, so you you can like or or don't like the fact that you, we should measure. We are living in a world where everything has a measurement. So. I do think that we should uh, go and push to change the way how we measure the system. I'll just give you one example. Uh, tomorrow we're going to discuss about networks, one that we've launched at the UN level called HESI, the Higher Education Sustainable Initiative. We've launched that in Rio. Uh, Find to this initiative, one of the accrediting bodies like Equis for Business School came to us and said, could you help us to change the way how we measure performance for business school. So, and we have a responsibility to do this kind of lobbying uh, uh, for, for, um, for the ranking, for the government, and, and for accrediting bodies. And, and I do think that, if I, if I can share my personal experience, the most important thing when you start to ask for metrics, it's you start to discuss with other people in the university. Most of the time, I think it's one of the, our mistakes uh, when you are convinced, when you are deeply engaged in sustainable development, we are all staying with nice people. We are all here, nice people, uh, uh, and that's cool. Uh, but where are our deans, uh, our chancellor, our, our, our financial director? They should be here with us today. So as soon as you start to discuss on figures, you start to share something and to, and to argue sometimes with, with those people. Um, if you want to know what we should measure, uh, just a, a, a quick snapshot on, on, on the scope of our responsibility. When I say our, it's really higher education, but I think you can transfer that to any kind of education system. Uh, first of all, as any organization, we pollute, we discriminate, and sometimes we put the money in bad place. Okay. So, but it's roughly speaking exactly the, like any kind of organization. So we should do something on well-being, on personal development, on pollution, etc., etc. Of course, we have because we are teaching and we are doing research. We have a responsibility on the um, behavior of our alumni, um, and I think again Rio was one a, a turning point. I do think that before Rio. In many, many business schools at least, uh, uh, many huge universities, the message from the dean was, or the, the president was, often, we are not responsible. We are giving tools to adults. And after that, if they use those tools to create subprime, deforestation, or labor, labor child, it's not our responsibility. <laughs> and I think it's, it's not anymore the case. We know that we have a responsibility. We are not guilty for the behavior of our students, but we can't say, look, we are creating Nobel Prize or a or, or, or huge entrepreneur if we don't say that sometimes we produce the people who create crisis. And I do think it's our responsibility. As I said, we have also a responsibility to change the system. We don't like everything in our system. We don't like the way how the government choose to give the money to this institution or this project, we have the responsibility to push, the, to change the system. Of course, in order to do that, we have many, many uh, triggers, many actions. Um, in my school, I have a transportation policy, I have a non-discrimination policy, etc., etc. Um, and, and if I... So, so we try, for instance, to do... A, to buy fair trade product, to buy organic food, etc., etc., uh, and of course, in the research and program, we, we have the responsibility. We, we, we could put some specific uh, uh, courses. We could launch specific research chairs, etc., etc. So, if you come to matrix, as as it was mentioned before, you can measure impact or you can measure um, uh, means. Uh, so, I can measure the number of courses that I. I put in place, or I can measure the ton of CO2 or the ton of waste that I produce. Um, but I do think that we should now translate, trans, translate a little bit into impact. Um, I won't go too far on that because we have a session, working session this afternoon. I will explain about the literacy test. 
Um, but if you, if you have some of a session, please go online and type um, sustainability literacy test. We've launched something uh, two years ago, uh, which is a kind of TOEFL of GMAT, you know. It's the minimum knowledge, awareness that any students worldwide should have in terms of sustainable development. Uh, it's used, it is used now by uh, 400 universities and roughly speaking 49,000 students. Uh, if, you, if we come to metrics, there are many, many, many tools worldwide. Uh, some of the metrics can just focus on one specific uh, uh, aspect, like the, the, the green metrics, for instance, which is really focused on, on the green campus. You have some other will gonna take the green campus plus the strategy. Some will focus on the teaching part, on research and teaching. And just after Rio, We've launched a platform uh, on sustainable performance in higher education, which is a platform actually for all the people or all the organizations who have created tools, but not on this one specific uh, item, but on the whole institution approach. Research, pedagogy, um, the green campus, the social aspects, uh, local community engagement, etc., etc. So this is, this is the, the, the website. Um, and just so, so we have tools from, uh, um, from all over the world, from US, France, uh, South Africa. And again, when I say we are, it's just a platform to, 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 to share what our experience. Um, and and what, we, what we try to do is, if I give you one example about my school, uh, I use the Green Plan, which is the French tool for now seven years. And it's a tool that we managed to put on the government plan. So in 2016, all the university in France should use this tool. It doesn't mean that they should be good, but at least they should use the tool. And just to give you an example, for the moment, our score, uh, it's a self-assessment score, is 3.8 out of 5, okay, at Cage. The average score in France is lower than the com compliance. For instance, yesterday we spoke about disabled people. Most of the university are not organized to uh, invite disabled people in, the, in their school. And we plan the target, when I say is metrics can help you to, to, to build your strategy. We have a goal in 2020 to reach 4.5 out of 5 in my university. Thank you very much for your attention. Morning, everybody. Chair, <coughs> Dr. Khosla, my fellow panelists, and very distinguished participants here. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that the paradigm shift from growth to growth with sustainable development is not enough because we are doing this entire exercise with the same neoliberal thesis. Now you just can't fit in sustainable development goals into the original thesis which remains the same. So is true for education. Yesterday Anant remembered Paulo Freire, I would remember him again. He said that education can either free person to think and act in the best possible way or educate the younger generation to conform. And I find that everything is going towards conformity and then we are aiming at sustainable development of the whole globe. So there is a big contradiction and let's be aware of this. I am not really here to comment on that. My second comment on the set of SDGs set for education as goal 4 and the subsequent uh, indicators which have been developed are obviously are obviously because you you can't really do anything fresh and you have to do some out of box thinking and that we have not still done and maybe we are do, gathering here to think about it is that all that you are going to collect information on is the byproduct of the data that gets generated simply by admissions into the schools the data on infrastructure and how many people leave, how many children leave of them, how many are boys and how many are girls, and what kind of infrastructure is available for skill building, skill development, and then of course there is a software which talks about 
what has been the outcome learnings now let me tell you that a country like ours which all of you know has 120 billion people of 120 million we are there very strong 1.2 and going to rise increase we will always be interested in looking at numbers alone and we'll be very happy to tell you that all of them have been enrolled to schools and yesterday professor leela visaria informed us in one of the sessions that 50 percent drop out and then there is a great dispute between the academics and the government people and then you get into the issues of how the data is collected how it is not collected and i will tell you that in the primary education business there is no single agency which gives an authentic data you ask one government agency it says no we don't generate it it is generated by the other one doesn't know what gets into this data so i am just pointing out that in a country like india which is quite good otherwise and it's going to be good i am an indian so no problem but i think that there are serious problems and more so in the developing countries so i am just trying to tell you that the problem is that the way these indicators are there and you will read them and i am not going to read them out but for instance simply like saying that percentage of girls and boys who achieve proficiency across a broad range now at primary level at secondary level tertiary level for skill and the acquisition of proficiency there was there is an agency in this country which tries to do this for proficiency in language and computation mathematics and government accuses that this agency is bogus because it gives it returns with very sad figures on the quality of education so there i am only saying that one of the things that the indicator also and yesterday also it was mentioned that even the non official data must be sort of incorporated as sdgs of this objective is laudable but where is the credibility of this institutions vis a vis the state and i think yesterday this point was made again so let's remind ourselves that the civil society is a persona non grata now if heads of the states are finally go and sit at that platform and going to argue about this they will simply discount these things so now having said all this i mean this is a generic and i can tell you uh, from somewhere another indicator and i still read in sdg who is sds sn is here and let me make a very humble request you don't start calculating number of extension worker per thousand families for per, per thousand farmers it's a disaster we have done it in india what are these extension workers going to do sorry for a side mr chairman but this is important what are they going to do these extension workers are going to sell gm seeds and then give all the biochemical and agrochemical techno agro mechanical technologies for farmers to borrow and then finally hang themselves and this is we will call an sdg indicator what are these extension workers of from the state going to do that is the question i think we have to go deeper coming back to education again i was just giving this example but please remember i don't see any stakeholder in this as i said it's an administrative by product to which you are collecting for your education indicators and please don't do that what we need to do is at the school level at least when we said that we are going to have right to education we did talk about school management committees and the school management committee has all the stakeholders it has management it has parents it has students it has teachers there is not a single indicator which says that what do the teachers feel about the quality of their students the school management committee is not asked what are how do they evaluate their infrastructure students of course will never be asked there is not a question like india which is an important of course you can always argue that national indicators can be different but i would still consider in the developing countries where infrastructure resources are scarce we may have to ask worldwide in all the low income countries that do they have toilet for girls for instance this is one of the major indicator in india why children girl children drop out we don't find that in indicator so we may be country sensitive fine region sensitive but if you had built this indicator from below that is building set of indicators from smcs onwards 
and then ask these stakeholders to calculate the admissions, dropouts, quality, learning and educate them on that and then try to aggregate this at a vertical level, each level, I think it will make more sense. Now, two minutes on vocation and skill. Why I said there is a neoliberal thesis? What kind of vocational and skills you need? It simply says, the SDG says relevant, 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 technical, relevant. This. What is relevant? It's a value loaded term. All that relevance is, which is technology, it's all techno fix. It's all high capital intense industries that you want to do the cutting edge technologies. And this is the skill you want to put. And how are you going to put in these poor universities where the state is not funding and where you have privatized? The first indicator says that free education. In this country, the paradigm has shifted. Now it is, even in primary, there is no free, there is free education. Not free. The R is disappeared. All is free education now. And better education is free education. And bad education is free education. How do you do this? Now, on this vocation and skills, is there an indicator which says that what is the extent of students' participation and in doing the sanitation and cleanliness work in the campus, in the school, college? How much of their own requirement of stationery, clothing and basic needs are produced by children themselves at various levels, primary, secondary, tertiary? We do this in Vidya Pet, not very far away. I am now invoking Gandhi. Because Gandhi said in basic education, this is what you are supposed to do. If you don't live together and work together, what skills, living skills you will learn? And if you don't produce the things that you need, how will you develop skills for living? And then you can go on to the higher order and order. Now these indicators do not exist in the present education monitoring that we are going to do. The sustainability is in the philosophy that I am talking about. There needs to be a big paradigm shift in the way we are educating the next generation. It has to be education of heart, it has to be education of hand and it has to be then education of head. And we are putting the head down and first and leaving the heart and hand away and we expect that we are going to be sustainable. We are not. So that is the contention. That's a general criticism. But we can still do it if we seriously do the SDG monitoring. By introducing these innovative indicators into the whole game, we can still do it. Because then the systems will be compelled to work in the way in which pro it, it will produce results. I think I should stop here. Thank you. Myself. I am the secretary of the Community of Evaluators South Asia, which is a network of evaluators across six countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, India, and Sri Lanka. And we've just completed our third conclave, what we call our evaluation conference in Kathmandu, along with eval partners, where we set the global evaluation agenda for the SDGs. So please do visit our website to have a look at it. Um, I'm going to be, after this very provocative speech that you heard, um, I'm going to be talking about using evaluation to get actionable answers. Not evaluation for the sake of evaluation, but to provide us answers so that we can reach our goals. I'm also very happy to represent gender equity on this panel. <laughs> all right. Um, I think all of us have talked about uh, the SDGs, and this is just to remind ourselves that it's about the future we want. And there are some key features that we need to remind ourselves when we think about monitoring and evaluation. The uh, important one is that no one is left behind, so we are emphasizing equity. We are also emphasizing the means of implementation along with the goals, very critical. We recognize cultural diversity, and so we recognize that there are different indicators that need to be translated according to the local and cultural context. The goals are all interconnected, so if you do not pay attention 
to other goals. So if you're talking about education, but you don't talk about poverty, and you don't talk about access, you're not going to be able to achieve your goals. So it reminds us that we live in an interconnected world. And very important for this talk is about follow-up and review. So each of these goals with the emphasis on measurement targets and indicators is uh, reminding us that we need to follow up and review what we are doing. So what does that mean? It means that we need a robust and an effective, inclusive and transparent follow-up. And we want to do that because we want to promote the demand and use of evidence for policy making. And that's very important if we want to reach our agenda um, of sustainable development goals. So what I'm going to frame my discussion today is in three points. So what so? How do we maximize the role of monitoring and evaluation? And so what? How do we make this evaluation actionable? And the third is, okay, we've got an evaluation, now what? How do we maximize the use and increase the use of evidence? So how do we maximize the role of m &E? Just to remind ourselves here, most of you may know it, but just so that we are all on the same page, monitoring is a routine tracking and reporting of information of the program, of your activities, inputs, and so on. So it's a routine tracking. And when we talk of evaluation, we are making a judgment of the merit and worth of the program. So that is also a systematic collection, but we do make a judgment. So we need to remind ourselves both of monitoring because we are tracking the means of implementation, and we also want to look at our outcomes, not just our outputs as we were reminded when we want to do our evaluation. So what do we need? We don't need just evidence. All of us collect evidence, some evidence. But if we want to influence policy, we need very strong evidence. So we have an option. We can have a very good report, but it's not really policy relevant. So you have done your data collection well, sampling well, so on, but does it help to influence policy? Maybe not. You may be having very policy relevant information, but the technical rigor lags. And that's sometimes an excuse provided by many decision makers that, okay, uh, I don't have confidence in the findings that you've provided. So the best option, of course, is to have both technical rigor plus a policy relevant information that gives us better evidence and therefore a relevant policy. So how do we maximize this role? We need to make it local, country-led. And our previous speaker reminded us that in diverse countries such as ours, we need to look at the diversity of stakeholders which is naturally available to us. And we need them to give them a role to lead and own the evaluation process. And so collaboration is the key word. Collaboration for what? To define those key, those big evaluation questions. What are you interested in finding about? And very important is the perspective. We often just look at targets without looking at what perspective are we looking at? What lens do we want to put on? Is it the equity lens, the gender lens, uh, the right space? What lens? And that perspective should actually drive what methods we use, how we use our findings and communicate it. So it should not be something that's very techno fix or technocratic, but it needs to be relevant to our culture and the needs of our countries. I want to stress a bit on the equity aspect because I think this is very critical in the SDGs. The SDGs are meant for all countries. And what it particularly says is that we need to track transformation. So we need to look at both success as well as failures, what's happening, what's not happening. We particularly need to look at what are the unintended outcomes because we may be having targets and indicators but we are not actually looking at the unintended outcomes and what's happening in spite of what we set out to do. So, when we talk about equity, this is not what we want. I hope everybody can see at the back. But what we are looking for is something like this. So it's not about equality, which is about the sameness. Equity is about fairness. How do we give those who require a step up what do we need to add in order to be having an equitable uh, activities, goals, and evaluation? Okay, so how do we make actionable? It's all 
uh, we always talk about evaluation and so on. So here we have an example of a program. We say that an investment in adolescents' nutrition is going to lead to the empowerment of adults, adolescents. And we, we put that out there and that's going to be our program. But really, who says so? Really? Somebody could question that. So one of the methods that we use is to use a theory of change. And the theory of change helps us to articulate what is that change? How does it happen? And what's important is in that context, with that group of people, so we are localizing it and ensuring that we address the issues that are most important to us. And so then we describe our program, what activities uh, will lead us to the expected results. Sometimes theories of change can be very tricky. So uh, should I read that out? Can you read at the back? No? OK. So here is a, uh, uh, um, somebody from the ashram coming and asking Gandhiji, Dear Mr. Gandhi, we regret we cannot fund your proposal because the link between spinning cloth and the fall of the British Empire was not clear to us. <laughs> so we need to have a very clear theory of change. So as you probably got from that little cartoon, is that the essence of the theory of change is to link your activities to intended outcomes and impacts. Not on outputs, not on numbers. What is the impact? What's the outcome? So here you have an activity. And here is somebody who says, what are you doing? What's your activity? Well, I'm cutting rocks. But if you link it to the intended outcome and impact, the same activity becomes something like this. I'm building a temple. So the, it's really important to link our activities to our outcomes. OK, so what are my activities? How do I place it in my theory of change? So here is a theory of change. You probably have seen it. Inputs, activities, outputs. Very important to go beyond those numbers that we are talking about. And when we talk of education, it's not about bums on seats, as we say. But we want to talk about what's the change that happens as a result of whatever input or intervention you have. What are your short-term outcomes? What are the long-term outcomes? And this theory of change helps us answer what activity was difficult to implement, why was it so, why did it fail, how do we replicate, and so on. However, that's, there is still a problem. There can be a question that, if I go from step one to step two, what happened? A miracle? Not necessarily. There are some other areas in the theory of change that we need to be extremely cognizant of, especially when we are looking at SDGs, equity, and looking at with that lens. So if you're building a, a TOC, you have this um, slightly linear. You can have it in other ways. But this is not enough. What we need to look at, and this is what we talked about earlier with other speakers, we need to check our assumptions. What are those assumptions that drive our indicators? And unless you place these assumptions center stage, it would be difficult to have relevant indicators with relevant outcomes and impacts that we are looking for. So when we have an open nutrition feeding center, we need to know whether eligible children are there. If they come to eat, do they like the food that's served? If the mothers are learning good nutrition practice, well, do they have the motivation to try out new food? And if they are cooking nutritious food and feeding them, what is the impact related to? Are there any infectious diseases that are impacting uh, the outcome? So we really need to check out our assumptions and our uh, subcultures and culture diversity when we are looking at the theory of change. I'm going to the, uh, so uh, now what? We have an evaluation, we've got our theory of change, we've got our indicators, we've got it all set out. How do we increase use? Well, we evaluate for lots of reasons, and I'm sure you're familiar with all of these. To make various de decisions, to improve programs, to be accountable, and so on. But sometimes, is this how you use your reports? Do evaluations just sit on the shelves? Uh, are you using it as a prop, as furniture? And this is one of the biggest problems with evaluation, that we are not using it in the manner it's to be used. But when you do think about evaluations, there are 
a lot of questions, and I'm sure all of you face these questions when you're trying to uh, uh, develop an evaluation. So what we need is a new evaluation approach that emphasizes use, <laughs> users, learning, and ensures ownership of that process. So when we talk about a use-based evaluation, we have to talk about three components. One is the user, the uses, and evaluation focus. I'm going beyond methods and tools and so on. I'm talking about how we can use good evaluation, because unless you use it, you cannot make changes in your programs or policy. So what this really means is that whoever are the evaluation users, we have to work with them to ask them, for what purpose are you going to use the evaluation? And what do you want to know? And we have to identify who wants to know. That's the most critical component in order to uh, use our evaluations. So the user is not the audience. What we normally do is we develop a report, have a dissemination meeting, and assume that it's going to be used by others. But what this approach says is that identify your users and how it's going to be used right from the start. What difference is the use going to make? Well, actually, what it means is that evaluations are not judged by the report. You've given a report, made a presentation, that's the end of your evaluation. What this says is that unless you use that evaluation, the evaluation is not complete. It also means that you need to focus your evaluation. When you want to use the evaluation, when you have a user, you need to focus the evaluation. You need those big key evaluation questions that the users are interested in. And how do you develop those questions? We go back to the theory of change and we select which of these are your big key evaluation questions that you want to address. I just want to end with four lessons that are really important when we are thinking about evaluation of SDGs. The first one is that please do remember that evaluations are extremely political. Uh, we need to look at the context and our stakeholders. Those evaluations can be thrown out, even if they're good, technically sound, policy relevant, if we've not paid attention to the political nature of evaluations. The second is that it's an extremely powerful resource. So it's very important that we identify who owns it. And the ownership needs to be with multiple diverse stakeholders, who uses it and who benefits. The third one is that we need to focus on inequities. So we really need to choose our key questions and our theory of change carefully. And my last slide is that let's recognize that there are multiple ways of knowing. It's not just pencil and paper. We have many cultural ways of knowing and let's respect that. And let's learn to listen and to tell the story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanu. Uh, our final speaker is a uh, representative of Youth Equity. ...of this conference, international conference, and stand in front of this uh, esteemed panel and distinguished guest. I come from a very young institution, SDSN Youth, which is the, one of the assemblies at the UN Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network, which, it, which in itself is a, a relatively young institution uh, being part of the UN system. Uh, led by Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, uh, UNSDSN has a leadership committee which has eminent uh, 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 members from across the globe. Uh, we have four members as of now uh, in the leadership committee from India and there are several members who are from South Asia uh, and at SDSN Youth I am the South Asian representative. Uh, being very young but uh, we have in the recent years we have done an incredible job uh, we have published reports, we have uh, gathered knowledge, we have aggregated uh, learnings from the business, from the civil society, from the government and from the UN system uh, by, by a collaborative process. We have documented and we have shared it across the globe. Some of the reports are very well cited and among the most cited reports, reports on sustainable development. So now because this session is about uh, goals, uh, indicators and monitoring, I'll stick to the topic. Uh, so while I was coming to this uh, conference yesterday, crazy things happened. Uh, I had a goal in my mind. I had, seven, I had set targets. 
I, I did the same today again. Uh, I had a goal. I had to reach this uh, panel uh, to, part, part, take, part, to participate in this session. I had set uh, targets for me, but the indicators were not proper and, and, and I missed on schedule. So apologies, Chair, and apologies, panel, and apologies, distinguished guests. So uh, uh, my, my task has been made very easy by Dr. Sudarshan and again Sonal, who have uh, uh, expressed, who have, who have uh, very well uh, emphasized on the need for uh, localizing indicators. And then Sonal has very well put, uh, and she, she, has, she has emphasized on the need for uh, indicators and the need for uh, monitoring uh, policies and monitoring schemes. So, uh, I'll, I'll stick myself to what uh, SDHN had published in May 2015. Uh, this was one of the reports uh, primarily which focused on monitoring and evaluation and uh, for, uh, for SDGs. So 17 goals, uh, yes, this is, this is uh, something which translates the concept of sustainable development into, tra into tangible entity, but then that is half-baked story. So to, what do we need to you know, bake this complete cake? So we need uh, indicators, we need targets. Why do we need them? We need them because uh, we need to measure our progress. We need to uh, estimate our accountability. We need to see, we need to understand how stakeholders are participating and what has to be changed, what has to be improvised upon. And uh, uh, the good thing is that the current framework for monitoring which has been uh, prescribed by the Internet Agency Expert Group and High Level Panel. Uh, it, it says that there are four levels of uh, monitoring and evaluation. So first one happens at the global level wherein we have the goals, we have the 17 goals, and then the next level is the regional level, and then uh, there's a national level, and there's a thematic level. The good thing is uh, in the prescribed mechanism, uh, which is yet to be endorsed, uh, uh, although, the, uh, the, although the framework has been endorsed, but then the indicators are yet to be endorsed and this will happen in 2016 this year. Uh, international consultancies are being undertaken, so Dr. Sudarshan, I'm sure uh, the point that you have raised that uh, the indicators for education need to be localized, that will be taken care of by the government and, and the stakeholders in the country. So, uh, now coming back to indicators. So, the national level goals, the national level targets, they have to be the, the, now, now these have to be complemented by thematic uh, indicators. They have, these have to be uh, complemented by thematic goals, and these have to be th uh, complemented by regional goals. Uh, the good part of the prescribed mechanism in the current uh, system is that uh, the national governments, the, the the governments are free to choose set of indicators that are uh, available. They are free to choose sub -level, uh, national level targets and some national level, national level targets. Although the global targets remain same, but then uh, the nations have that that kind of liberty, and I think that calls for uh, that, that that allows that gives liberty for localizing indicators that allows for localizing the targets. So now, uh, <laughs> now this is a very fine time. Uh, we have 1.8 billion population, which is the youth, and in the next 15 years, by the time SDGs come to closer, uh, it will be today's youth who will be having the torch in their hands. So it's very important to you know bring youth on board, and that's why uh, uh, that's what SDSN and SDSN Youth is trying to. We are trying to collaborate with uh, youth institutions and government agencies, civil society, and the business to. Uh, make an inclusive development and an equitable. Uh, we are trying to the, create that platform that provides equity both to the girl child and to the and to the male child, and provides opportunity. Now coming back to the kind of atmosphere we have in India at present. So Honorable Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi says that we need to skill India. We need uh, skill India from Jawan India. India ko now we want to make skilled India. And at the same time, His Excellency Secretary General says that. Uh, in his, in his synthesis report, he has very well recognized uh, what uh, international labor organization has been pitching for quite some time, decent jobs, but how to do that? Does the current education system allow for that? I don't think so. So what, what can be done? A, what I would prescribe is that uh, the education system should not intend to you know, feed into, into the child's mind that education ultimately leads into income generation. It, it should more be about social good. That is what sustainable development is about. 
So second, this this was the first point, and then the second point, we have uh, we have been having uh, cultural collaborations and different kind of collaboration between the developed nations and the developing nations. But then now it has to go, it has to happen between the developing countries, between the landlocked countries, between the uh, uh, middle income countries. Why? Uh, I'll, I'll cite just one example. India has been recognized as an IT geek for quite some time, uh, and this is very strange that uh, mobile money was introduced only in 2012 and Kenya had mobile money way back and India is the IT geek. So I think it's really important that uh, that kind of collaboration should happen and that kind of in, uh, atmosphere should uh, be created and, that, and education should create that kind of uh, environment. So uh, now coming on to the next point. Uh, so. We need, we need skill in India, what do we need for that? The current education system only translates, only transforms the youth, it only translate, transforms the girl child and the, and the boy child into bread earners for their families and not into social entrepreneurs. But to addressing challenges of sustainable development, most, let me tell you, most of the challenges that are to come, they have, we have we, the, the, the kind of challenges that are to come in the future, uh, we, we, can't, we can't think of them right now. So the kind of, Brigade, but the kind of changes in that we need at local levels. Uh, we need transformation in our education policy. We need transformation in the kind of education system that we have and the curriculums that we have. Uh, so we need to also create an ecosystem, and this has to be a collaborative effort between the government agencies, between the civil society, and the, and the business. So uh, this is more, this is this is more about uh, about India than. Uh, Coming back to the point that uh, Sudarshan ji had raised that uh, the current mechanism for uh, uh, evaluation of goals and uh, the indicators, the kind of indicators that have been prescribed only allow for counting on numbers. Uh, the good part is that the prescribed mechanism under uh, SDGs, the kind of indicators we have, it also allows for uh, uh, so it allows, it gives, it provisions for identifying both the qualitative aspects and the quantity, quantitative aspect. The indicators have not yet been ex, have not yet been finalized, and this is the good time that uh, stakeholders from the government, from the civil society, from the business should come together. Uh, I would urge that the uh, youth institutions and the grassroots institutions should take active and they uh, active should make active participation. They should be proactive and they should voice uh, for the social good again why because uh, sitting in delhi it's very difficult sitting in the sitting in new york it's very difficult difficult to understand the kind of challenges that you face at the last mile uh, so until unless you we, we all of us come together i think the national level indicators that are yet, that are that will that are yet to be evolved it's very difficult to bring them on board the kind of diversity uh, we have in this country, it is also, this, this, is, uh, this is an opportunity, but this is also a challenge for development practitioners, this is a challenge for government, and, and I think that uh, civil society institution can play a big role. Now the, now the idea of indicators, uh, the idea of targets, the idea of overall SDG goals, how many people are aware of SDGs, that's the biggest challenge that SDGs uh, and, and the UN system or, or the development agencies or the civil society are facing in today's time. Uh, we need high level of uh, awareness generation, but to do all of this, but to achieve, and to achieve the kind of uh, outputs that we want, the kind of evaluation that we want to do, I think, uh, I think the, there, is, there are huge capacity gaps and those capacity gaps have to be addressed primarily in the African continent, in the middle income countries, in the landlocked countries, in, uh, in SIDS. There has much to be done, there has to be enough, finance has to be raised. Uh, to sum up, I'll say that there is a collaborative effort that has to be put in. Uh, without without uh, collaborative efforts, it's difficult to, uh, as, uh, to expect the kind of uh, outputs and the current kind of outcomes we want from the SDG era. Thank you. Uh, we've had uh, exposure to a very large number of ideas. Uh, I would hesitate to summarize them all. I would basically just add something that um, has concerned me for the last 40, 50 years that I've been working in the field of sustainable development. Uh, the world, as you all know, is changing incredibly rapidly. 
20, 15 years ago, there were no phones in this country. Today, every single citizen aspires to uh, having a personal phone. We've got such an enormous range of changes taking place and such speed with which these changes are taking place that the primary purpose of education really has to be how to learn to think. How to learn to think about what our problems are and how do we find solutions to them. Um, my son, uh, when he was growing up, asked me um, once, uh, the only time he ever asked me, what should he do in life? And I said, the one thing you need to do is to be able to think through what you and all the people around you are going to need. And that's basic needs. That's going to be survival on this planet. It's going to be how to live with each other. And we've heard a great deal today about how do you evaluate. Well, I think one of the primary, primary indicators of the quality of education has to be, are we producing thinking human beings, thinking citizens of the world? So uh, I, we've really run out of time. I'm happy to entertain one or two questions, but we've got to wrap up so that the next sessions can start on time. We're going to have plenty of time during the breakout groups to think through more of the details of this set of issues. They're very, very important issues. And uh, if somebody has a very pressing uh, point that they would like to make, uh, a comment, this is the time uh, I can give you two or three minutes, but that's about it. So is there someone who would really like to take the floor? There's a microphone here. Yes, there's a gentleman over there. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, my only point is that it has been repeatedly said that sustainable development goals are something which are a benchmark thing, which are something which has to be robust. But I personally feel that they do not need to be robust. For in order for them to be sustainable, they need to be anti-fragile. They should learn from evaluation. The indicators which are set up, they are robust. Instead, the indicators should be expandable. They should be customizable, bottom up, not top down. That is all. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent point. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else? There's somebody in the back there. More change, Garu. Put a hand up. Excuse me. Um, I just want to say that uh, I like to remark that you said very much that we should be thinking individuals and education should help people think. But at present times, we faced with a counter movement, top down movement, be it from corporates, be it from media, be it from others, where they're molding the thinking of individuals and want people to be just consumers and not thinkers. Every current is flowing in the opposite direction. So how do we conquer that has to be an important point for discussion. If we have to be creative and find uh, new innovative solutions. Thank you. Uh, one more last point about, about evaluation of uh, of education. There's one here. Oh, I guess somebody else has preempted it. Go ahead. Namaste. Thank you. I would just like to raise a caution about uh, indicators and measuring. Uh, what I'd like very much for my friends, family and my village is a world in which we have a lot of feeling, care and understanding. And I would really like this conference to take a position so that we don't measure ourselves into paralysis and we don't indicate ourselves into a coma. Thank you. Thank you. Three extremely good points, uh, and we will certainly take them on board. And I think the breakout session will be a good, good time to discuss them in more detail. I want to thank you for being such a terrific audience, and the panel who really touched on some of the most fundamental and important issues. Thank you very much.